Well, good, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks very much uh, for, for joining this evening as, uh, as we have an opportunity to talk about uh, transportation at a crossroads, uh, a discussion about uh, transportation here in, in New Westminster, uh, but also regionally here. And uh, I'm joined by a, a very special guest, uh, our new CEO of TransLink, uh, Kevin Quinn. Uh, so, so welcome, Kevin. Uh, before we uh, begin uh, uh, this evening, uh, though, I, I want to begin by recognizing and respecting that New Westminster is on the unceded and unsurrendered land of the Hulkam Elam uh, speaking people. We acknowledge that colonialism has made invisible their histories and connection to the land. As a city, we are learning and building relationships with the peoples whose land, land we are on. So, so welcome everyone. Uh, we're we're really excited to uh, to be hosting uh, this uh, this discussion this evening to talk about. Uh, transportation in our region to focus on on TransLink and our, our, our public transit uh, transit system. Uh, we're going to be uh, welcoming people this evening uh, who are joining us uh, here on on Zoom uh, to, to be a part of this discussion. Uh, but we're also uh, live on on Facebook as as, as well too. Uh, for those watching on Facebook, though, uh, we won't be able to interact in in terms of the questions. So if you do want to to be able to ask questions, and, and we are hoping to spend a lot of our, our evening today uh, fielding questions directly from, uh, uh, from people in the community, uh, please do join the, the Zoom meeting. And uh, through the Q&A feature, that's when, when people will be able to, uh, uh, to ask their questions. And uh, you know, we've got uh, Kevin Quinn, the new CEO of, of TransLink. I'm sure there's, there's lots of questions in, in the community uh, that, uh, that people might have about, uh, about where we are with transportation and, and, and TransLink. Uh, also want to let folks know that uh, we do have closed captioning uh, available, and if it is not uh, automatically working, um, please look for the, the live transcript or the CC button, and, and by pressing that, you'll be able to, to, uh, to, to get the, the live transcript. It, it is automated, so there could be a few typos here and there, um, but, uh, but that service is, is available there. So with that, uh, you know, I'd like to begin just with, uh, with a few comments, because it has, has obviously been... Uh, uh, a, a different time, uh, you know. I think in, in past times we'd be we'd actually be hosting this forum in person together in, in a room together. But uh, we're still working through uh, through through a global pandemic, and you know it seems uh, you know 2019 seems like a, a lifetime ago right uh, uh, right now. And at that time uh, we were riding a, a wave of momentum here in uh, in Metro Vancouver when it comes to our, our transit system. Uh, for four years straight, we'd had record uh, ridership uh, ridership growth, and we were working on rapidly expanding our, our transit system. It was it was a really exciting time uh, to, uh, uh, to to be looking at public transit in in the region. And as uh, you know, as as chair of the mayor's council uh, for for the region, there, uh, you know, I think we all had some some really big ambitions. But uh, you know, I think as we all recognize, the the world got uh, you know definitely disrupted in uh, in, in March of of 2020. And uh, although there's been various impacts, uh, uh, you know, around the world in lots of different sectors, uh, public transit systems around the world have have no doubt uh, faced uh, faced some significant uh, significant impacts. Uh, you know, namely, our, our ridership went down 80% in uh, in in the uh, in the onset of, uh, of of the pandemic, and, and no doubt that has been uh, a significant challenge that we've had to deal with. Now. More recently, we are starting to see signs of life coming back to our, our transit system. And uh, as, of, as of May of this year, every month we've seen increased growth and in, in ridership, uh, ridership coming back, which no doubt is, is encouraging. And, uh, and you know, I, Kevin will maybe talk about this a little bit more, but you know, uh, Metro Vancouver and New York were the first uh, transit agencies in Canada and the United States to actually get back to 60% pre-COVID ridership, which I, you know, I think is a testament to the transit city that, uh, uh, that we are in, in, in this region. Here locally in New Westminster, you know, we're no, uh, no strangers to, to public transit. So we have 
uh, had the highest uh, transit mode share in, in our community in the region. And I think largely that's because we are a community that has, has land use that has been uh, traditionally built around good public transit. And we have some amazing transit assets with five SkyTrain stations and uh, really excellent bus service in, in the community. But we too obviously have aspirations in the future to, to see those, those services improve and provide more sustainable transportation options. So it's been an interesting time where we've had to uh, you know, manage, uh, you know, a global pandemic and its impact on the transit system and, and kind of maintain some stability. But we've also been really mindful during that time about how do we get back to that, uh, you know, the, the ambitions we had in our had in our region and get back to some long range planning for for the region and, and get back on track with uh, improving public transit in, in our region. You know, I think when we, we look at the challenges we're facing with the climate emergency, uh, the reality is, in my opinion, that's a that's an emergency, and that is not work that cannot be completed as, unless public transit is is a key piece of that. So, as we work to stabilize and work through the pandemic, uh, you know, I think we're we're very eager to be getting back on track with the long range planning. And with that in mind, uh, you know, the mayor's council has been working very closely uh, with with TransLink on the development of Transport 2050, the region's long range uh, plan in the region. And we're quite ex excited about that becoming really the the new bold and. Uh, 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 roadmap for, for our, our region to, to really kind of set some priorities and continue to put that strong stake in the ground that uh, public transit is a key piece of, of the transportation vision for the future of Metro Vancouver. So with that, I'd like now like to introduce uh, Kevin Quinn, our, our new CEO at, at TransLink, who, uh, who joined the organization uh, in, in August, coming us, coming us all the way from uh, uh, the Baltimore Transit. And I'd like to, you know, I think this is a really wonderful opportunity to, to introduce him to, to our community, um, learn a little bit more about uh, his experience and his vision for, uh, for, for TransLink. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit what, uh, what drew him to our, our region uh, here and, and, and really kind of open up a conversation. So with that, I, I'd like to pass the floor to you, Kevin. Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you. That was a, a great setting the stage for a, a great conversation about transit and transportation. And um, so we prepared a little a little PowerPoint. And so I just have like five slides and some remarks that I think will maybe add to a lot of what you just noted. And so um, I don't know if we can bring that up. That's great. So um, uh, thanks again so much for having me. And uh, it is really great to speak uh, with you and with the residents of, uh, of New West about the future of transportation um, in our region. So as, as you noted, I am brand new to the area. And so this summer, uh, my family and I, we did make the trek about 5,000 kilometers away from uh, Baltimore, Maryland on the east coast of the US here to Metro Vancouver. And I just got to say that, um, you know, for me, I really jumped at this opportunity. You know, I'm a, a, a transportation guy. I have been for many years and the uh, opportunity to run such a premier organization like TransLink was uh, a pretty incredible opportunity. So I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And over the past few months, I've been doing a lot of um, a lot of meetings like this and really enjoyed getting out. My family and I have been getting out, exploring the region, meeting customers, employees, business groups. And uh, in fact, when we arrived, my family and I arrived in uh, July, we actually settled down for the first three months in New West. And so um, I got to live as a New West resident for a few months and uh, certainly got to know all the dog parks, you know, where you get to know uh, all the dogs' names, but you don't know their owners' names, right? And um, really got to know uh, Queens Park, uh, some really, you know, beautiful areas. Uh, and I took the SkyTrain down at the New West Station every single day to work. So really got to know uh, New West quite well. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, as uh, you all know and, and read about every day, you know, Metro Vancouver is, is really growing. And by 2050, it's anticipated that uh, 1 million more people will be living in this region. And with that growth, with that growth, moving people and moving goods around the region uh, is becoming increasingly complex. And so uh, it's really important that we plan for growth very early and that we are, are very intentional about um, the kind of region that we want in the future. The fact is that we, uh, we know we simply can't build um, more roads to accommodate movement throughout the region. And congestion and transportation emissions are all, really only going to continue to worsen if we don't change uh, our habits around the way we move uh, around this region. Um, uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, I want to talk just about uh, climate change and the climate emergency we're facing. Um, these past five months have, I think, been a real eye opener for the region. You know, we sit here today still fighting a global pandemic. And in the midst of that, um, British Columbians have experienced some of the most catastrophic severe weather that anyone has ever seen. I know that I arrived like the day after the heat dome um, and it was still boiling. <laughs> it was very hot. And uh, that brought record breaking temperatures, wildfires that devastated regions. More recently, we had the ultra rare tornado that hit uh, Metro Vancouver at the beginning of November. And more recently, as we've all really tragically seen the series of atmospheric rivers causing just record rainfall, flooding several mudslides. And so, you know, we're all hearing those warnings from scientists who are linking a lot of these extreme weather events to climate change. So, you know, of course, uh, one of the reasons we're here is that how we move around the region has a major impact on climate change. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? And so for our part, you know, sustainable transportation is, uh, we think, really one of the keys here. You know, transportation represents uh, the single largest source of carbon emissions in Metro Vancouver. Uh, it can, it, it's 35% of the region's total greenhouse gases come from transportation. So TransLink's portion of that is 2.7%. And, and part of that is that we already have uh, North America's largest electric trolley bus fleet, a large fleet of renewable natural gas fueled buses, um, we have some battery electric buses on uh, Route 100, actually, between Marpole and 22nd Street in New West. And we have an all-electric SkyTrain network that, you know, cuts across the region. So we're already very much a leader in reducing regional greenhouse gases. And in fact, if you kind of break it down by ridership, more than a third of our customers are traveling today on near zero emissions transit. So uh, that said, we certainly have a plan to continue to further our, to reduce our greenhouse gases by 2030. We have a low carbon fleet strategy that ensures that all of our buses are gonna be zero emission by 2040. So I, you know, I think our perspective is that, um, you know, not only does taking public transit help reduce greenhouse gases across the region, but the more people who are choosing to trade those car trips for, for transit, for cycling, for walking, you know, they're also reducing congestion for those who can't take transit. Uh, that also allows for more room on the road network for, for goods movement as well. Um, you know, in terms of doing our part, making active transportation uh, and public transit part of uh, your life and part of your routine is perhaps the most important thing we can really do to combat climate change in the region. And so that is really a big piece that underlies uh, transport 2050, our region's new 30-year uh, transportation strategy. So could you jump to the next slide, please? So we've been working on the transport 2050 strategy for a few years now. Um, phase three of our public engagement recently closed where we um, were seeking feedback from the public. And as you can imagine, you know, in doing a lot of this engagement and analysis throughout the pandemic, we've seen um, several trends that have emerged. And some of those are good. Right, you know, more digital access. You know, uh, a lot of people working from home, remote work. Right, uh, that's less cars on the road. Uh, we've seen more interest, really good increases in walking and in cycling. At the same time, we've seen some concerning, some concerning trends, such as increased rates uh, of people driving alone. Right, single occupancy vehicle uh, increases. So the strategy that's outlined in T twenty fifty has over a hundred actions to really try to deliver choice to the people of Metro Vancouver so we can meet a, a really key goal of having public transit, walking and cycling make up uh, at least 50% of all passenger trips by 2050. We have other goals in T2050 as well, like improving transportation affordability, as well as cutting 20% of the time that people and goods spend on congested roads in 2050 compared to today. So, and, and all of that, all that I just went through is really uh, a movement towards this big goal of having a carbon neutral region by 2050. Uh, and so one of the ways we get there, next slide please, is by uh, expanding the new rapid transit footprint across the region with over 300 kilometers of new additional rapid transit. And when we're, when we're thinking about future rapid transit expansion, we of course wanna be sure that we get the right mix of rapid transit. You know, we can make a really big difference at the street level today. 
right? There's infrastructure today, you know, our roads, our, our roadway network that we can put rapid transit on, which will make up a lot of these projects. But we've also got to keep in mind the distribution of people across the region is changing. And so we want everyone to have easy access to reliable transit really no matter where they are. And so, um, you know, details of what kind of rapid transit these corridors may see and some of the prioritization that needs to be done around that is going to be looked at further uh, as part of the investment plan and the new mayor's vision uh, that Mayor Cote talked about. Um, we've also looked at some really important interregional connections, like improving travel between Metro Vancouver and Whistler, Squamish, and the Fraser Valley. And uh, I'm really proud of this effort. It's been a massive undertaking. It's actually the largest public engagement in TransLink's history. Uh, and so I think, you know, from my perspective, if we're going to tackle um, some of the biggest issues of our time, it's so important that we have strong regional consensus around a, a bold plan like this, if we're going to have a meaningful impact. Uh, next slide, please. That's my last slide. And then we'll jump into some good Q&A. Uh, I want to just note um, that it's, uh, it's, I think, a really exciting time. I'm really excited to be here. It's, it's so uh, fun to be in this line of business because there's just endless opportunity to serve the public better. Um, I think, uh, as you can tell, investing in transit, investing in sustainable transportation is what's going to help get us there. And I, I think part of that also is that, you know, my, my approach here is also that, you know, transit agencies um, as I like to say, they're, they're not just about getting you from A to B anymore. You know, transportation, uh, is it cuts across some big issues facing this region, like affordable housing, like social equity, like climate change. And so I really want TransLink to lean into this role as a real community building organization and find new ways to connect with our customers and forge um, a lot of new partnerships. Because the fact is that we can't do any of this alone. We need partners uh, in our customers uh, the municipalities, uh, the province, the federal government. That's so, so critical. So with that, um, as, a, a, as perhaps a framework, a foundation, hopefully that built on kind of what you were saying, Mayor Cote, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, really excited to be here. Thanks. Well, well, well thanks very much, uh, Kevin. And uh, you know, really, re really pleased that uh, you, you're here to kind of join us and uh, engage in this conversation here. So, uh, you know, now we want to give a chance for uh, for folks that are joining us uh, an opportunity to ask questions. I think this is a, you know a, a unique opportunity uh, uh, to have the, the new CEO of, of TransLink uh, be able to kind of engage directly with with your questions and thoughts. So, in the uh, the Q and A feature of uh, of Zoom. I, uh, you know, just uh, type in your questions there and, uh, you know, I see some questions already already popping up uh, there and we're going to do our best to, to kind of go through all the questions that uh, that do get popped up. So, so please do add, uh, add your questions uh, in there. You know, I'm going to start just with my own question. First of all, uh, Kevin, uh, you know, I, I guess I'd love to kind of get your thoughts of, of your first impressions of, of, of Metro Vancouver, uh, you know, and particularly kind of comparing from from the experience you had in uh, in, in the Baltimore and Maryland uh, region, uh, you know, kind of what are some of your early impressions of, of, of our transit system, how it works, what's, you know, what are what are some of the uh, key things that are really impressing you? What are the things that you think are, are, are areas of improvement in our region? And, you know, maybe if you want to reflect even just about how, uh, you know, how governance is, is a little bit different between uh, here in, in Maryland, I think that would also be, be quite interesting for folks to learn about. Sure. So, um, so some key things, uh, you know, I think um, Canadian, well, just in terms of transit itself, you know, Canadian systems, I think, really understand the importance of, uh, of frequency. You know, when you have high frequency transit coming by bus, by train, that's, that's a really key thing. And, and um, if you go visit and take transit in uh, a U.S. city, I think you'll find that unless you're in, you know, like a New York or a Chicago or a really big city, the, the bus frequencies and the train frequencies just aren't uh, what, you know, they're, they're just much faster here. And so it's really great to see. And so, um, you know, frequency is freedom, uh, as they say in transit. And so uh, this gives people really the, op the ability uh, and the opportunity to not have to plan their day around, you know, a bus coming every 30 minutes or something, right? Uh, they can they, they can operate, and, you know, uh, without a schedule. So that's a that's a really key one. I think this region, um, and, and I've said this before, and I've gotten some uh, uh, 
maybe criticism, I don't know, criticism is the right word, but, uh, you know, I think that the land use is really good in this region. I, I think it could always be better, right? Uh, but there's some really good density that's been created that allows transit to be successful. And so, um, you know, I think there are areas where uh, we could build up certainly more and create better high density communities, but, you know, it's, it's a really good framework. And I think that it's that density that's allowed us to get to that 60% of pre-COVID ridership that you noted, um, uh, you know, from uh, from down to what 17 18 percent right so uh, so that's a key thing from a governance perspective just to talk about that for a second you know in Maryland uh, it's interesting because the the Maryland Transit Administration actually reports up through the executive branch of government it's a pretty unique um, structure um, and and uh, I think like like any structure there's pros and cons right there's there's always uh, politics and there's funding and uh, one model isn't necessarily better than the other, right? And and I think just about every agency in the U.S. has some funny difference in working as a as a transportation authority with a different type of board or governance structure. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Those are some initial thoughts. No, and, and, and very nicely diplomatically put there. I, I think that's uh, probably key to your success if you have to work with mayors and and provincial elected or state state officials. So. Uh, uh, no, we appreciate that uh, that reflection. And so I'm going to jump into kind of actually the first two questions I see, and they're they're somewhat related. Um, you know, the first question is how will TransLink prioritize where where rapid transit will be built first? And you know, I think we all see that map, and it's pretty exciting to look at you know the significant coverage and 300 kilometers uh, there. But the reality is we have to start somewhere, and there has to be a, a prioritization. And then I see a second question regarding the UBC expansion. Is, is there any updates that you can provide us with that? So I think those two questions are, are related and I'm wondering if you can maybe uh, uh, step in and, and tackle both of those. Yeah, sure. So um, so on the prioritization uh, process, uh, you know, that's certainly part of the mayor's new vision process that uh, you, know, you know we're starting to undertake and something that the mayors are gonna be working on uh, very much in 2022. And, you know, for TransLink's part, you know, we uh, are doing a lot of data analysis and a lot of modeling of those corridors to be sure that, you know, we have all the right data there. And then uh, the mayor's council is then in a position to, you know, really evaluate uh, that current and future transit demand, um, take a look at growth across the region, and then, uh, you know, really match that up against, you know, put, putting kind of a regional hat on, uh, evaluate that. I don't know if you want to comment on that at all. Yeah, no, you know, I, I certainly can. And, you know, I think some of the successes we've had in, in, in Metro Vancouver with our, our, our more recent uh, uh, expansion of, of transit actually dates back to uh, the mayor's 10 year plan that was developed, uh, you know, about eight, eight years ago. Uh, it, it really kind of set out the priorities that, uh, that that's been laid out and, and kind of in a very sequenced way. Kind of provided that guide both for TransLink but also the mayor's council to uh, to kind of know what comes next in, in 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 terms of priorities. Now, one challenge we're facing right now is where you're, we've been so successful with the original mayor's ten-year plan is that we're at the end of it. Yet there is a, a lot of important transit projects that are are kind of floating around uh, out there. Yet there isn't that good priority list. So uh, really, the goal that the the mayor's council uh, in the first half of next year is, is do a refresh of that mayor's 10-year plan. And I think we're going to take the work, good work that's been done with Transport 2050, which kind of provides that, that, that long-range plan for the next 20, you know, 30 plus years in, in the region, but really kind of pull out of that plan and say, what do we want to accomplish in, in the next, uh, next decade? So uh, I know the TransLink team are going to be working to, to provide a lot of good data for the, for the mayors uh, so that we can kind of make good informed decisions and so that we can actually compare apples to apples between uh, the different uh, priority projects and, and the different uh, decisions that will be made. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, uh, you know, at the end of next year, we're going to have a, a new vision and a, a revised, a refreshed mayor's 10-year plan that will then hopefully be as successful as the last one was in terms of being that that guide to to where uh, where, where transit expansion goes. Yeah, I'll I'll just add that I think um, you know it's taken a uh, I've been used to a different model for so many years, right? And coming here, it's it's uh, it, you know you start to absorb sort of how you have this 30-year uh, vision, right? That that really lays out what what we want our region to look like in 30 years. Um, and then uh, you've got uh, the investment plan that lays out the funding. And then you've got this mayor's vision, which I think is a great tool to lay out um, sort of a consensus driven model around 
here's what we're going to prioritize and here's what we're going to do. And I, you know, I'll just say that I think it's a, I think it's a really great model that um, lays out some good stability and some good vision for, you know, what's going to be built and gives residents an idea, you know, what, what things are going to look like. Yeah. yeah I'll, sure. um, just a comment on, on UBC. I know that that was sort of tied into this. Um, so, you know, we've, uh, we're in the process of finishing the preliminary business case for that. Uh, that'll be finished in the beginning of 2022. Um, certainly our ridership modeling is showing that it will be a very well used, uh, well used line, right? The, uh, I think, you know, right now that 99B line is, uh, I, I think, as they say, the busiest uh, bus route in North America. And uh, from what I can tell, I think that's true. So, you know, pre pandemic, I think they're about 80,000. I was actually just trying to look for the number 80,000 per trips, uh, uh, per trips per day to and from UBC and over a thousand buses flowing through UBC's bus exchange. So um, it is a bustling community. Uh, and, you know, certainly though, uh, the decision of how that, you know, ranks up against different priorities around the region is part of the, the mayor's vision and in evaluating, you know, how to best spend, you know, resources and, and consultation certainly with the public and, and with the province to determine kind of what the next step is there um, after uh, the Surrey Langley SkyTrain. Yeah, no, 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 certainly. And, uh, you know, I think uh, there's been a lot of a lot of talk over the last number of years about uh, about the extension to, to UBC. And, and and I think there's actually a bit of confusion as to where exactly in in the mix that that project is, because the SkyTrain expansion along the Broadway corridor to Arbutus, that's already a fully funded project that is currently under under construction and is moving forward. But the project to extend it to UBC is, is not yet been been prioritized by by the mayor's council and is not a funded project so it is it's it's definitely in the mix and is being being studied he heavily there but uh, but there are more more steps to go before that that project becomes uh, becomes a reality but no doubt in terms of its impact uh, and, and and ability uh, and projected ridership that would use that to utilize that that extension it is is obviously will be a serious consideration for for the work we do and, and makes uh, you know, a lot of sense both locally, but I, I think both provincially and federally, there's a lot of interest in uh, in, in that work as well. Certainly. So the, the next question I'm seeing is is kind of talking about kind of connecting to our our our, our regions, uh, you know, next to us. And the question is, are, are there any plans to to extend the West Coast Express uh, into into the Fraser Valley? And I think maybe Kevin, if you can also maybe chat about even just more broadly about connecting to the Fraser Valley in, in Transport 2050, or even other regions like Squamish and Whistler, which we know are, are two very big growing regions that are not part of the TransLink uh, jurisdiction. But having said that, reality is, uh, you know, there, it, it is one larger region that we're trying to connect here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so let's see, I, I talked a bit about this kind of model that's changing in transit at the, at the Surrey Board of Trade meeting the other day. But, you know, there's a real, um, there's a real kind of model that's changing in transit. You know, the, it used to be there was sort of a singular city and, uh, you know, it was, it was a model of all roads lead to Rome, right? It was sort of this hub and spoke model where everything kind of ties in. And we're now seeing, you know, these different pockets of activity that um, in many ways need their own transit service. And, and, you know, what ends up happening, you start looking at kind of a heat map of activity you see that this is really quickly becoming, especially by 2050, kind of a big mega region, right? And, and so that mega region needs um, uh, transit options to and from all those important nodes. But you also see the emergence of other places like a Whistler, like a Squamish that also need their own, their own service. And so T2050 uh, dives into that and, and looks at those interregional connections uh, uh, going north, um, going east, uh, south, and uh, really takes a look at that. So I think for our part, um, you know, we've got to evaluate that against, um, uh, you know, all the other priorities that are out there. Uh, I'll also just note that I think there's always opportunities to partner, um, you know, with BC Transit. So, you know, for something that I'd really love to see and that I always think is such a, um, uh, such a hurdle is often for, for passengers is a, you know, a unified pair, uh, fair payment uh, system, an integrated fair payment system that you could use, say, for example, on TransLink, on BC Transit, on BC Ferries. I'd love to see us get there. And I think, you know, that's part of that is the key to making those interregional uh, uh, pieces happen. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks very much. So, 
Um, moving on to the next question, I mean, you know, I'm going to go for an easy one, and I think I'll probably just take this one, uh, Kevin. Is uh, are there any plans to to replace the the Patella Bridge now? As as someone who actually lives at at the foot of the the Patella Bridge and hears the pounding, um, I, you know, I can uh, I can safely report that construction has actually started on the replacement of of, of the Patella Bridge. Uh, it's very early in the in the construction stage um, there, so obviously we are a few years before the replacement will be completed, but. This has obviously been a, a long-standing uh, discussion in, in New Westminster for, for several decades about the replacement of that, that bridge. Uh, but the provincial government uh, made a commitment uh, you know, a few years ago to, to fully fund and replace that project. And uh, uh, even though the, the pounding I hear from, uh, from my living room uh, is, is not always the most pleasant sounds, it's a long overdue transportation project. And, and the reality is it's a bridge that is, is past its, its, uh, its useful life and, and definitely needed to, to be replaced. So, uh, you know, obviously, we're we're really excited to see that important connection uh, between uh, Surrey and uh, and the city of, of New Westminster. And we think with new modern infrastructure there, there's going to be better opportunities to to actually integrate that uh, the, the new bridge into our transportation system better than the uh, you know the 70 plus year year bridge that uh, is is currently there right now. Okay, so just having a, a quick look at, uh, at at kind of the next questions here, um, you know, I think we've got more questions about kind of the uh, regional rail connections, uh, and and I know you chatted about this uh, um, there, but uh, you know, I, I guess the question about you know buses uh, for for kind of connecting versus you know rail and and uh, and using CP tracks as a, as a lifeline, given that roads roadways can often uh, uh, you know have their unreliability aspects uh, to them. Uh, there and I think this is kind of specifically looking at Abbotsford, Whistler, and 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 Tawasin as as kind of finding connection points uh, to to that there. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, um, so you know, the lines that T twenty fifty lays out doesn't sort of presume you know what the sort of what the technology will be, right? It doesn't T twenty fifty doesn't say this will be buses, this will be rail. It's it's sort of um, mode agnostic in a way. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see the question again here. Uh, but I guess, um, sorry, I think it moved real quick. I think the, I think yeah, oh, there it is, right rail. The... Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the big piece of, of rail is you got to have the right of way to, to do it, right? Rail can be uh, a very expensive. I mean, I, I guess the way I'd say it is, you, you know, generally the way these things start is you start off with a bus connection, right? You, you start that, uh, that off uh, and you build the ridership. If you see uh, that ridership growing, it can kind of graduate, right? Uh, that's the way transit often works is it kind of graduates from bus to, to rail, uh, maybe a, a light rail to a, you know, a heavy rail type of a system. But you've, you've also got to have the, um, the right of way to make that happen. And that can be tough, but I totally understand. I mean, I, I see the question there, the, the, the comment that the CP tracks were a lifeline for motorists stranded near Hope in the floods. You're absolutely right. You know, those those tracks um, are, are more permanent. And so uh, they can provide uh, a really great value. I, I think it'd be great to see. Yeah, no, and you know, I think it's it's one of the challenges we, we often have because, you know, I think, uh, I, you know, I think there's always a preference to, to kind of the rail solutions, uh, you know, whether we're talking about SkyTrain or, or light rail versus, uh, you know, bus for rapid transit uh, there. And I think there's very good, Good pluses to kind of investing in that that rail technology. And as someone who rides SkyTrain frequently, it is an amazing system that can really get me to to a lot of places very quickly and uh, and, and efficiently. But I think there's also has to be a recognition that uh, you know rail is is significantly more expensive than than investing into uh, even very high quality uh, bus service and, and bus rapid rapid transit. And uh, we really, as a region, have to kind of look at the pros and cons about being able to cover that much more of the region with uh, with good transit versus yeah. Uh, you know, maybe a smaller, smaller region. And I think one of the discussions, you know, we, we had in Transport 2050, and I think will definitely be a part of our discussions as the, the refresh of the mayor's 10-year vision, is, is just having that good discussion uh, about, you know, finding the balance between that, because it's not going to be one or the other. There's still going to be expansion of, of SkyTrain and, and rail into, into yeah. our region. But I'm actually really hoping we can find some creative ways to uh, uh, to find other other ways of rapid transit in, in our region. Uh, and, you know, I think this region doesn't have a lot of experience in, uh, you know, anything really beyond regular bus service. But if you go to different parts of the world where buses run on separate roadways, you know, yeah. have have stations that look like SkyTrain stations and and really operate at that frequency, um, you know, it does open your eyes that there are other technologies that might be more cost effective that might 
help us more quickly and cost effectively, uh, you know, blanket the region in in, uh, in public transit. So it's a debate at the mayor's council table, and I know it'll be yeah. a debate out in the public as well, too. So yeah, I'll just just to comment on that. I mean, there are some some really cool uh, bus rapid transit systems that are out there that you know use the roadway that's out there today and and sets aside some uh, of that roadway space for buses. The the um you know bus service is often um, looked at as sort of operating uh, heavy and capital light, right? You know, so buses, you just need a bus, right? You need a bus and your main expense is is a driver, a driver's salaries and benefits. And so, you know, a bus and a bus route, um, you can get out there pretty quickly. You can, you can do that um, relatively quickly, right? A rail system, on the other hand, is is exactly the opposite. It's capital heavy and very operating light, right? You're you're what you're paying for really is the the track, the locomotive, the cars. You know, all of that um, is is very expensive and can take a lot more time. And so, you know, for a lot of these, we've got to make that determination of of uh, how soon do we want it? What do we want? And how soon do we want it? Uh, that's a that's always a big question. So uh, the next question here, I, I think it's more of a, a a Christmas wish list I, I, I see here, and uh, although all the questions are coming in as anonymous, I, you know I think I recognize uh, this question as as one of our uh, uh, delegates at the Mayor's Council. So thanks very much for for joining us this evening. But uh, uh, the question comes, uh, you know, about how can we make sure that there are more, um, you know, what I'm thinking, dedicated bus lanes, and maybe a comment about uh, some of the issues with on on the North Shore and some of the aspirations and plans for for bringing uh, rapid transit to, to the North Shore. Sure. So, um, you know, T2050 does envision a rapid transit connection with the North Shore. And so, you know, for TransLink's part, you know, I think we we support that and, and stand by the mayors uh, that and the First Nations that have come forward with that vision. I think certainly it's needed. I, I will tell you personally, as a newcomer to the region, um, the North Shore is very congested, right? It is it is very, very congested. It's tough to get through uh, the North Shore. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, again, it comes down to priorities and, and uh, you know, I know that, that those routes and that area is certainly being looked at as part of the mayor's vision. Dedicated bus lanes can uh, are things, per the conversation we just had, right, you know, uh, things like a new bus service, a rapid bus service can happen much more quickly than, say, a new rail line um, and provide very similar benefits. Uh, so there's some, some thoughts on that. No, thank you. So uh, I will move on to the, to the next question. Uh, you know, as, as a resident taxpayer and transit user, how can we let the region's mayors uh, know that we want more transit ASAP and, and, and are willing to, to pay for it? And, and maybe, Kevin, when you kind of think of that question, uh, you know, obviously well before your time, but, uh, you know, we've, we've had a bit of a rough road in trying to find new funding sources for, for transit in our region. We did have a, a failed referendum a, a number of years ago, and I I'm wondering, as you think about this question, maybe kind of think about even past successes you've had in uh, in, your, in your previous uh, time in, in Maryland about how do we how do we fund transit? Because you know I think the region supports transit, but you know the buck hits the road when we have to find ways to, to pay for that. Yeah. Um, so I guess instead of uh, you know having a, a great solution, I can tell you that, that you know where I was in Maryland was facing very similar challenges that are being faced here. So you know. Uh, we're all seeing more EVs out on the road. We know that that fuel tax, that gas tax is a declining revenue source. I think that our projections show out in 2030, I think it's $90 million less per year. Um, so we've got to figure that out. And I think, you know, all options have to be on the table. And, and, and I'll also just say, you know, you've got the gas tax piece. Um, we've, we're also seeing declining revenue right now from, you know, lower ridership. And, you know, right now our projections are showing, you know, about 60 to 80% of ridership coming back by the end of 2022, but we're still projecting a, a significant deficit. And so I think, you know, whether it's, um, uh, depending on, on the type of tax, I mean, we've got to figure out a long-term sustainable, you know, revenue source. I, I think that's going to be really key. I know that, uh, you know, other states have, have played and toyed with uh, different ideas around, um, you know, charging and uh, cost charging and things like that. We've, we've got to get a handle on it. No, for, for sure. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of scroll through the, the, the questions here. Um, you know, there is a question actually about kind of the impact with COVID and, and ridership. And, uh, 
you know, it, wondering if you can give, kind of give a more detailed uh, update about are, are people coming back to transit and what are the strategies TransLink's implementing to, to kind of win riders back? Sure. Um, so, uh, so we're seeing some interesting trends. Um, so, you know, just to speak regionally for a second, you know, we're, we're seeing, um, we're, we're at roughly 60% of pre-COVID ridership right now. Uh, certain areas are coming back stronger than others. So south of the Fraser, uh, Surrey, um, uh, around there, you know, they're roughly around 70% of pre-COVID ridership and sort of leading the region in, in coming back. We're seeing certain events where people are coming back to ridership, uh, the Shipyards Festival, Canucks Home Games, um, Halloween weekend. We actually just, uh, data, this just in, uh, we hit a new high on Black Friday. Um, and I think what we're seeing, you know, with these examples is that, you know, when people have somewhere to go, uh, they're choosing transit. They are, they're choosing transit. So we, um, uh, we're trying to capitalize on that and be sure that people are having a really good experience. A lot of this comes down to people having a place to go. You know, a lot of the ridership before was really driven by uh, office workers in, you know, downtown Vancouver, for example. And, you know, with a lot of folks not being back at the office, I'm sure many people that are watching right now maybe haven't even been back to their office since, you know, March of 2020, which feels like five years ago. Um, but as employers are starting to bring people back to the office two, three, four days a week, we're starting to hear that that's, you know, in, in our conversations with the business community, that a lot of folks are doing that starting in January of 2022. That's, um, we think that's going to start to change. For our part, we're, um, we're doing a good bit as well uh, in, you know, one, really pushing folks to transit as part of solving the climate change crisis. Um, we're also uh, running a new uh, sweepstakes program, uh, uh, Tap In to Win. And so we're encouraging folks, go in, uh, go to our website, register your compass card, and you can tap in to win just amazing prizes, right? So really uh, putting that carrot out there for folks, you know, encouraging them, get back on transit. You know, you have the opportunity to win some cool prizes like an e-bike and e-scooters and, you know, all sorts of great stuff. So um, you know, we're just really trying to encourage people in any way that we can to get back on transit. And, and what, what we're really seeing is that when people are taking transit, and I've heard this anecdotally from many riders, they've said, you know, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel. I hadn't been on transit in 18 months and they've gotten on transit and it's been good and they've felt safe. Uh, we have a mask mandate in place and uh, it's 99.9% .9 of folks are wearing masks. I take transit every single day. I can tell you it's very, very, very rare when I see someone without a mask. And I think all of those lead up to a customer experience where people want to ride transit and, and they are going to come back. Is it going to be a huge wave where suddenly, uh, you know, one Monday in January, everybody's back? No, it's not going to work like that. We're going to see a slow, uh, a slow trickle back up. No, thank, thanks for that. And you know what, I, I know it's obviously something that the mayors are, are, are very keen and uh, looking to the updates that we get, but it has been encouraging, you know, our, our transit ridership was kind of flatlined for almost a year and it wasn't until May this year, yeah. but, you know, we're seeing life come back to the transit system. I, you know, there's even been times I, I haven't gotten a seat recently on, 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 on SkyTrain and to me, uh, you know, yeah. I'm taking that as, as, a, as a positive sign and you know what, my, you know, my gut is telling me we are still a, a transit city here in Metro Vancouver. Uh, we have all the good bones of good transit service. And when the time is right, and as we work through the global pandemic, uh, uh, you know, we are, we're, we're, we are going to get our, our riders back. But, you know, as you said, it's not going to be a light switch where on one Monday, you know, it'll, it'll all be back. It's going to be a slow, gradual work back, to, back towards that. So moving on to the uh, next question, you mentioned, uh, you know, that uh, you, you moved here with uh, your family and, and your dog. And uh, we have a, have a question about uh, dogs on, on, on SkyTrain there. And, uh, you know, you might, you know, I, I think this is, has been a bit of a discussion in, in the past. And there's always been, been a challenge with, with kind of bringing pets and, and dogs onto, uh, on, onto SkyTrain. Uh, you know, I think no doubt as a pet owner myself, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of folks that are are kind of interested in in, in expanding those opportunities beyond on beyond the current uh, uh, plans there. But we also know that but many folks are are very apprehensive of of, of dogs, and yeah. they, that can actually be a barrier for other people to to enter enter transit. But I'm wondering if you can uh, you know, kind of speak to anything that you're aware that Transit's working on, or even reflect what you've seen in other parts of the world on how they've addressed this, you know, what can often be a bit of a, a tricky issue with transit agencies. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, 
I I would love to take my dog. My uh, I have a golden doodle named Pancakes, who is just the cutest dog in the world. And um, you know, I, I can tell you that uh, you know our current policy, you know, requires you know it to be a service animal that is uh, you know has been kind of certified as a as a service animal to be brought on transit. Um, I am uh, I am I'm happy to you know kind of take this one away and and uh, look into this further. Uh, I don't know that I have a great answer for this. The um, uh, I don't know I can't think of many cities that sort of openly allow for pets on the system. Um, I I think you bring up a really good point that people are very very apprehensive around dogs and uh, or can be. And so, it, you know, as a, as a dog owner myself, um, I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm more than happy to, to dive into this and loop back with you on this. Yeah, no, I, I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, you know, I, I remember reading an article a few years ago, um, you know, how, how New York was allowing dogs on transit as long as they were in a bag. Um, sure. And people got very creative. They actually started cutting four holes in bags and actually just had you know, a bag that the dog would be walking through, which was obviously not quite the the intent of the policy. So I don't think we're alone in in, in struggling with that. But, um, you know, I, as the owner of maybe the second most cutest dog in the world, uh, my French Bulldog Piper, you know, obviously, I'd love to to be able to kind of take her on some other trips on transit a little bit easier than kind of the carrier policy that uh, that exists right right now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to kind of move to to the next question I see coming up here. It, it, it's kind of involving uh, people with uh, with disability uh, conditions, and uh, uh, I just kind of have a quick look at here. Okay, so I, I think the question kind of relates to uh, you know I think using transit, but in 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 connecting that with uh, with with vehicles. If I'm I'm sorry, the question is kind of bouncing around here. Um, able to determine if there's some of some of these individuals are people with disabilities that rely on their vehicles. So, um, sorry, I'm just trying to uh, get to the question. Uh, okay, so first of all, the vehicles that are single riders, are you able to determine if some of these individuals are people with disabilities that rely on their vehicles? And I think there's a second part of that question. And as the last leg of the trip by transit can be the hardest to do because of fatigue for some people with disability conditions, how can you create a affordable parking for Spark users near system hubs such as the SkyTrain station? Sorry, hopefully I've read that question correctly. Um, so I, I think they're asking in, in terms yeah. of I, the SkyTrain system can actually be incredibly accessible and, and usable for people with disabilities, but uh, sometimes it's it's difficult, I guess, to to access the or get to the SkyTrain station there. And are there opportunities to to kind of find it, you know, easier access and and subsidize even parking? Uh, yeah. you know, in, in some of our park and ride facilities or other parking nearby to uh, to really reduce those barriers. I, I think that's what the question is getting at. Yeah, so I guess just some thoughts on this. You know, I think, um, you know, first of all, you know, accessibility begins with, uh, I think, really, really good sidewalks. We've got to start with good sidewalks and whether that's on TransLink property or whatever municipality we're operating in, we, we've got to have really good sidewalks. They form really, um, the backbone of any good transit system. I've, I've, I've said it, you know, um, you know, every transit rider begins as a pedestrian and that's, uh, you know, uh, for every single transit rider. So we've got to start with, you know, an accessible uh, sidewalk. Um, the, the, the next piece of this regarding accessibility, I think is really important is, is elevators and escalators, right? We got to be sure that we have well-functioning, good elevators and escalators, um, something I've been really diving into um, I, you know, one of our riders a few months ago uh, was having, um, you know, an issue reaching his destination. And so I went out and, and, and rode with him uh, down to the stadium uh, Chinatown station and, uh, you know, really walked around and explored with him, you know, some of the issues he was facing. And so I think, you know, for TransLink's part, we've got to do a better job of um, thinking in that mindset sometimes and also getting out, you know, better information, you know, sometimes uh, you know, this was an occasion where, you know, we had a, a, an elevator that was uh, not working and we hadn't done a good enough job putting out uh, information about it. So we've got to be sure that all of those pieces of the rider experience are, are really taken care of. And I think I'm getting to the question here around, you know, the parking lot, right? We've got to be sure that, you know, our parking lots are accessible um, and that uh, those uh, types of cars are um, near uh, the train station, right? We want to be sure they're there. And if there's an opportunity for us to, 
you know, subsidize or take a look at a proposal around that, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that. Uh, I'd also encourage folks to use our Handy Dart service. You know, Handy Dart's a, a really great service. I was out a few weeks ago. I rode on Handy Dart all day with a variety of passengers uh, and really talked to them about the service. We also just added a compass to our Handy Dart vehicles. So you can now pay with Handy Dart with your compass card, really trying to get every uh, one on the same platform. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think accessibility has just got to be something that we have top of mind uh, every step along the way. If, and if there's a specific question uh, here or sort of a proposal here, I'm, I'm more than open to that. Feel free to call or, or email us. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and you know, I, I think one comment on accessibility, and, and I think folks in, in New Westminster will be aware, is uh, the challenges with the, with the Columbia SkyTrain station, which is one of the older SkyTrain stations in our network, and was really never designed with accessibility in mind or designed to be kind of the hub station in which two two different lines all come to come together. And I, I know TransLink has some longer term plans to do some what I would say significant rethinking of, of that station and, uh, and and redesigning it there. Um, but there is one kind of half elevator uh, that's part of a, a private property to be able to access that, which is completely I inadequate. Uh, you know, I know myself, even when my kids were in strollers, the, the nightmares that uh, that elevator would, would cause there. And no doubt people with accessibility issues uh, have, have long had some, had some concerns. So uh, it is an area that I know uh, I, I've recently uh, been in a meeting with, with TransLink to talk about. And, uh, you know, even though it's not currently in a building that's owned by TransLink, I, I think TransLink is moving towards actually be, being a lot more involved in, in that there. So I know that's kind of one big accessibility issue that, that always comes up, uh, uh, it comes up here. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly really uh, glad that TransLink is seriously looking at, at, at that station, both in terms of short-term solutions, but also some, some longer-term solutions, because that uh, is certainly not a station that, that really meets the grade with, uh, with accessibility standards. So I think we have time for a couple of more more questions here. Uh, you know, I think uh, there, and then we'll we'll probably have to say uh, good night for for the evening um, uh, there. So the first question here is: Are there plans to to get rid of the zones and go to a more time based or distance based uh, uh, fare system there? Uh, and it kind of makes the comment: uh, short trips across an artificial boundary make it un unfairly and more expensive than longer trips with within a zone. Yeah. This. So this is a topic that <clears throat> I know certainly predates me, um, and I think you know was something that came up in some of the public outreach and surveys around T twenty fifty. So you know we do have the three zone system today, um, and so uh, the fact is that the you know the compass card is kind of built. Uh, the compass system is built uh, just to be able to accommodate three zones. We uh, the the current fare collection system is. Uh, the backend software isn't built in such a way that it can accommodate um, a distance uh, fare based pricing structure. So, you know, if if there's a desire for that, we uh, we need to invest in a, a an upgrade of the compass system. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'll certainly, uh, you know, be considering that as part of the investment plan, if that's, you know, something that, um, uh, uh, you know, the mayor's council wants to move forward with. Um, but, you know, I think from my perspective, you know, certainly moving to a distance base has uh, big equity considerations, right? This is, it's a much more equitable system and there's lots of uh, transit systems, uh, you know, around the world that have moved towards distance-based fares uh, as they are, uh, again, a much more equitable uh, uh, system. Yeah. So, you know, I think there, there's definitely going to be some, some opportunities and it's, you know, even how you integrate, as we talked about before, with uh, with with other systems, whether it's BC Ferries or other transit yeah. agencies, or even potentially other other services like car share, and and you know, transportation is going to evolve there. And I think how we how we kind of connect into the systems, we we need to be open to, uh, you know, what I think uh, technology is really going to open up some some new possibilities there. So the last question uh, that we're going to go to get to tonight, and we've gotten through most of the questions. Uh, sorry if we haven't gotten through every single one, but I think we've uh, done a good job of getting through. Uh, but I, uh, this one's jumping up and catching my eye because it's it's near and dear to my heart, and it's it's kind of the work we're doing with our low carbon fleet strategy, and it's uh, basically asking how are the efforts going uh, to to get more electric buses uh, in, uh, in in the region here. So uh, Kevin, uh, can you give us an update on on you know kind of the work and the progress we're making with our low carbon fleet strategy? Yeah, so TransLink does have a, we do have a low carbon fleet strategy that, uh, you know, really lays out kind of the game plan for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, our, our plan essentially 
uh, replaces between 20, I'll see if I can get all this right, 2022 and 2030, replacing um, roughly 450 uh, diesel and hybrid diesel buses with battery electric buses. Um, uh, in 2024, we'll replace uh, 84 diesels with some CNG buses, um, and we'll also eventually be moving to renewable natural gas. The, the, what this essentially allows us to do is reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by about um, uh, 40, 45% by 2030. Um, but then it also sets us up for the future to have a fully zero emission fleet um, by the year 2040. Uh, the, the key to making all of this happen is the facilities. Everybody always focuses on the vehicles because that's what the riders are on and that's what everybody sees. And I, I totally get that. The, excuse me, the, the big piece of it is the facilities. And so we've got to invest just hundreds of millions of dollars into retrofitting or building brand new facilities to accommodate um, the charging for these. I'll, uh, you know, I'll just note that <clears throat> a lot of the battery electric buses you know, the batteries are such these days that, you know, they're very affected by the cold. And you, when you've got a, you know, a, a, a heating system on a bus that is operated by, uh, say, a battery electric system is, is like the least efficient type of heat there is when it's just an electric battery. And so it really drains the battery fast. And as we all know right now, we're having some colder weather, right? And so, you know, the distance that that bus can charge in the winter is very different than the summer. We also have very hilly conditions. So all of these take into account. And sometimes uh, what, what we will likely need to do is buy more battery electric buses. It's not a one-for-one -one replacement. So um, so there's the, the fleet piece. And then, yeah, the facilities, whether it's uh, in the actual facility owned by TransLink or if it's on-road in-route charging, um, and then an upgrade of all the software because you need to sort of schedule all the buses differently. The complicating thing is this is also, it's not like overnight, suddenly we have all these battery electric buses. We're mic we will be running a very mixed fleet for a number of years and being able to put um, battery electric buses on some routes uh, while we phase out diesels on other routes, it, it'll, it'll get pretty complex. But you know, I, I guess what I'd really say around this is absolutely, we have uh, such a strong commitment to moving towards a zero emission fleet and being sure that we're doing our part in reducing the region's greenhouse gas emissions. Well, I'm, uh, you know, obviously the, uh, we're, we're really encouraged your enthusiasm that you brought to, to kind of keep the momentum and actually work really hard to, to implement the low carbon fleet strategy. And I was encouraged, uh, you know, just uh, a few weeks ago at, at Metro Vancouver, uh, the Metro Vancouver board kind of allocates the, uh, the the federal gas tax, and you know there's there's something really beautiful about taking the the federal gas tax and investing it in the uh, the electrification upgrades at the Marpool new Marpool Transit Center to become the first really all electric. Uh, uh, transit right. center in, in our region and, and to me I think that's that's the type of investments we need to be and and, and kind of dedicating those, those resources there so uh, some really important work and uh, you know what it, it's going to be a journey and it's uh, it's going to take a few years but I think as, as the years go by we are going to see more and more of a, a lower carbon footprint uh, uh, with with our bus service which is already just by the fact that it's public transit already is is, is making a huge contribution that's in right. terms of, of dealing with with the climate emergency so I can see that we are, uh, are running short of, short of time, but uh, Kevin, I, I really want to thank you for, for spending the time with us uh, this evening. Uh, you know, I know uh, you're, you're new to the region and you've uh, taken on your new role at TransLink with, uh, with great enthusiasm. And, you know, I think we're really, uh, uh, really excited to, to have you. And, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure for myself to, to work with you here. Um, but you're, you're taking the time to get out into the community and, uh, and, and, and obviously visit local communities and, and participate in conversations like these. And, you know, I think like all cities, transportation is always a, a hot button topic. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, you took the time with us this evening to, to, to engage with some of our, our, our local residents. And I think we had a few uh, regional res residents as, as, as well too. And uh, always, always enjoy transportation. I'm, I'm sure we both could probably talk transportation all night long, but uh, Absolutely. but we do have to have to say goodbye for the evening. So uh, thank you everyone else for, for joining our conversation as well too. Some really excellent questions that uh, that I put forward and uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to to engage with you. And uh, and hopefully you've learned a little bit more about our, our new CEO and about some of the, the really important work that, that we're doing at, at TransLink. So uh, with that, uh, I want to wish uh, everyone a happy holiday season and, uh, and, and, and to all a good night. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.